Thank you. Thank you for coming. So, uh, anyways, the map making game. Over the last few years, I've been exploring some of the central issues of cartography, and I began by focusing on what cartography is as an activity and as a practice, and I gradually expanded the inquiry to include how it is that map artifacts that cartography produces function in human societies. The out, one of my continuing concerns has been to expose and explain why these in issues are relevant and pertinent to the cartographic practitioner. And another has been how to make these explanations accessible, useful, and usable to the cartographic community. The general skepticism of that community towards theory is manifest. Nevertheless, I've persisted in my attempts to bring an, an accessible understanding of the utility of critically examining what it is we are doing, what it is we are making, and why we are engaged in such activities. Speaking for myself, I found the investigation fruitful and rewarding and of tremendous value in my own practice. Last year, I spoke about some preliminary work I was doing on cartographic ethics, and today I'd like to run through a few related notions that I've been kicking around. One of the best strategies for bringing a fresh perspective to a familiar situation is that of making strange. Making strange strips off the veneer of familiarity we've come to expect and presents us with something that we have to discover anew outside of a context we normally rely on to provide pat answers. Both Derrida's tactic of deconstructing and Foucault's of problematizing employed means that made no claims to fundamental or moral truth and proposed no explicit ideals but instead sought to expose ambiguities and contradictions in order to open up new, unspecified social paths. Today I'm going to attempt something similar using a slightly different approach. We, we've all seen this diagram, Shannon and Weaver's so-called basic communication model. Over the years, it's been tarted up and danced around by a variety of writers, and although it outlines a naive aspiration, it ultimately fails to realistically describe anything useful. There was a part of the communication transaction, however, that Shannon and Weaver wrote about, but did not diagram the so-called effectiveness pro problem. Did he do what he was told? The action result is, after all, as they both admit, the end goal of communication. Adding an action result to the diagram changes everything. From this more complete diagram, it is clear that we can treat the transmitted message itself as largely irrelevant to the model and to the sender. As long as the performed action is more or less what was desired, the meaning of the message the receiver thinks she heard and understood is, as far as the sender is concerned, basically immaterial. Let's, let's consider this sample instruction result pair. The recipient in this model, instead of being the end point of the process, is just another element. This element or actor is more or less predictable within certain parameters and limits and can deliver desired results if properly played. Now, it may be useful to step through this using a Panofskyan three strata interpretation model I introduced elsewhere. At strata one, the recipient recognizes the signal as an instruction. At strata two, he decodes it using standard conventions of language and professional practice. And at strata three, he finds a way of applying the instruction to the world. And when, going back to Shannon and Weaver, we ask, did the recipient do as instructed? We can give it a big bravo Zulu. At this point, the point I'm trying to make is how the recipient who may likely have had some level of training, who likely may be operating under a variety of constraints, who likely comes preset with a range of predilections and, pres and presumptions, must be understood by the sender to at least the extent required to create a message that will, shall we say, push the right buttons. Communication, then, is a matter of pushing buttons. It's a sort of button-pushing game, a game played by the sender. Does that seem a bit of a stretch? And, but I, I propose that it does not. Games, after all, are simply learned cultural sequences that are culturally determined and characterized by roles, rules, goals, rituals, language, and values. Essentially, all social activity is a game of one sort or another. 
I'm certainly not the first to point this out. Thomas Kuhn, for example, described how scientific activities are described are determined by paradigms or game rules beyond which science cannot go without risking being seen as eccentric or unscientific. Berkeley and Wittgenstein also pointed out the pervasiveness of game rule structures, as did de Sade. The situation is described in Plato's cave and the parable of the blind man and the elephant. Culture itself is a game made up of other games. For example, Presenting a conference paper is a game. If I stand before you and ignore the pertinent rules and rituals, I may, may well be stopped and would likely not be invited back. The games, though, are not pointless. For example, it is the mapping game itself that makes map communication possible. It is the game that allows a map artifact to be recognized as bearing meaning, and it is the game that permits mapped meanings to be recognized and assimilated. Mapicity is, in this sense, our conceptualization of how the mapping game is played. Learning to play a wide range of social games and the shape and characteristics of which may evolve over time through intersection with countless other games operating within various circles of autonomy is clearly a critical imperative. Those unable to learn to play can be faced with consequences ranging from being seen as making bad maps to ostracization to or to incarceration in jails or in lunatic asylums. So much for the stick. On the carrot side, we may actually want to get the results offered to induce a recipient to act according to our instructions. Thus, to achieve the game's goals, we cannot ignore the game. It behooves us to master it. Now, there are two ways of going about mastering a game. One is to work within it, and the other is to stand outside. To work within the game, it is necessary to immerse oneself in it, to allow the game to define the sphere of understanding, the bounds of acceptability, the nature of the goals, and the value of the rewards. In effect, you, you drink the Kool-Aid and accept the game's predicate universality. The game itself determines how this immersion plays out. There are games like chess or go that have not changed in centuries, but there are others for example, what we might call hipsterism or dandyism, where ever-changing currents must be ridden like a wave. In every case, the roles, rules, goals, rituals, language, and values not only structure the game board and allow the moves, in fact, they define the world from horizon to horizon. Some people maintain that there's no alternative to the games of society. For Georg Hegel, for example, each individual self is inherently social and cannot exist outside of games because outside of social culture is just a vacuum. In other words, to be a person at all, one must be defined in, ter in the terms set by the games. Other writers, however, maintain that such games must be evaluated on grounds which are not simply provided, but must be framed and val validated independently. In this regard, Ralph Waldo Emerson, John Stuart Mill, and Friedrich Nietzsche all agree with Bob Dylan, who wrote that to live outside the law, you must be honest. At NASIS last year, I explored how we cannot find ethics within, but must bring them to cartography, and that matter is, is closely related to this. Standing outside the game provides the advantage of placing game events in a richer context. As Aldous Huxley wrote, there is an inside to experience as well as an outside, and permitting the one to inform the other is the very definition of sophistication. Now, there are hazards in trying to stand outside a game. One is susceptible, for example, to fallacies of motivation, judging a game of chess by the rules of lacrosse, or failing to see value in a game's rewards. On the other hand, the game, by its very nature, serves to restrict legitimate discourse and constrict the field of action. One recalls the failures of A Square, hero of Edwin Abbott's Flatland, to convince the King of Lineland of the existence of two dimensions, or his Flatland neighbors of the existence of three, or even of his friend A Sphere of the potential for four. Yet we recognize the superior position conferred by A Square's outside view. It's also been noted that our very language tends to keep us in the tracks of convention. Aldous Huxley wrote that 
Every individual is at once the beneficiary and the victim of the linguistic tradition into which he has been born. The beneficiary, in so much as language gives access to the accumulated records of other people's experience, and the victim, in so far as it confirms him into the belief that reduced awareness is the only awareness, so that he is all too apt to take his concepts for data, his words for actual things. So, how can we usefully get around these barriers without surrendering all the advantages afforded by the structure? How can we stand on a hilltop like Allison through the looking glass and see the board for what it is? Beginning around 1960, Dr. Timothy Leary published several papers on interpersonal psychobiology studies that describe human society in just these game structure terms. His central interest was how the mind adopted game structures to frame evaluation and understanding of the tsunami of input we face every moment of every day. In 1964, Leary wrote that we, that we are coming to realize that the brain is perfectly designed to fabricate any reality we program it to, con to construct. He went on to remark that it's useful to see all cultural institutions as expressions of the epoch's basic mythos, each discipline simply reorchestrating underlying themes of the age. That is, to colonizing the game to its own ends. While other writers have seen the games as a paradox, 38, I should be on 30. Why won't this advance? Ah, I must have hit something. While other writers have seen the game structures as a paradox or as a prison escapable only by faith, Leary had available useful psychedelic tools that employed properly and with reasonable preparations of set and setting allowed anyone to actually see recognize, explore, and explore the consequences and ramifications inherent in the learned game sequences and to dispassionately examine the roles, rules, goals, rituals, language, and values that come with the games of society and culture. He also pointed out, however, that from the standpoint of established values, the psychedelic process is dangerous and insane. A deliberate psychotization, a suicidal undoing of the equilibrium man should be striving for. With its internal, invisible, indescribable phenomenon, the psychedelic experience is incomprehensible to a rational, achievement-oriented conformist philosophy. But to one ready to experience the exponential view of the universe, psychedelic experience is exquisitely effective preparation for the inundation of data and problems to come. Richard Alpert tells us that Leary was reluctant to impose a model on the psychedelic experience because a model that exists in the West for these states is pathological, and the model that exists in the East is mystical and religious, and it's better we keep wide open. I take this as a recognition of the danger of stepping back from one game only to observe it from another game. This trap is sometimes called anthropology. Now, I am not by any stretch advocating the necessity of the psychedelic experience, but rather identifying the value of its often neglected and denigrated revelations in establishing an objective approach to understanding how to engage in the composition of meaning-bearing cartographic artifacts. In this, I myself tend to agree with Huxley that it is not necessary to salvation, but potentially helpful and to be accepted thankfully if available. Now, again, in speaking about the value of standing outside the game, I'm not denigrating the value of the game, but only pointing out the power that comes from knowing it is a game. Thinking outside the box is a stock platitude normally mouthed without context, but unlike a box, a game is a dynamic idea is a dynamic entity existing in actions and interactions. We can step out of the rules, examine the rules and rituals, deconstruct the language, weigh the values, and judge the goals. Is a given rule a valuable convention or simply an old habit? Is, it a, is the game worth the candle? Maybe this time, maybe next time. How about whatever? Is it? Anyways, all this stuff is important because although a game structures and legitimizes play, it can often offer no justifications beyond itself. As I found in my ethics talk last year, there's no purely cartographic ethics because ethics are not found in, but are brought to cartography. In the same way that you can choose to pack your ethical bags with discretion, 
or to just pick up your ethics from the side of the road, so too you can choose to play the cartographic game with a broad, sophisticated, well-informed skill, or you can play it according to the rules printed on the inside of the box. I, I would suggest that the rules in the lid are, at best, only a starting point. In Herman Hesse's novel, The Glass Bead Game, the rules of the game are only alluded to. They are so sophisticated they are not easy to imagine. Playing the game well requires years of hard study, and it is essentially an abstract synthesis of all arts and sciences. It proceeds by players making deep connections between seemingly unrelated topics." Unquote. This, this strikes me as a pretty good description of the cartographic game as well. Both, both are grounded in their persuasive rhetorical natures. The conventions of the cartographic game are varied and complex, but once these have been recognized and assimilated, the mapmaker has complete freedom within the system, and when he has mastered the various processes, he can use them to express his own feelings and ideas without any loss of sincerity. Far from hindering the originality or talent, the restrictions enable very subtle, polished effects to be produced. It is the forms and framework provided by the cartographic game itself that al allows the map maker to produce what Cicero called fluent arguments, brilliant reflections, refined and colorful descriptions in, in order to affect the desired persuasion and elicit the desired actions. So we can see some utility in viewing cartography as a game. But once again, to quote Dr. Leary, the problem is always just how much structure the game should have. If there are no overall goals or rules, we have ever increasing specialization and dispersion, breakdown in communication, a babel of cultures, multiple constrictions of the range in favor of a deepening of a specialized field. But if there's too much structure or overinvestment in the game rules, we have dogmatism, stifling conformity, ever increasing triviality of concerns, adulation of sheer techniques, and virtuosity at the expense of understanding. Yeah, I'm right on schedule. Clearly thinking, clearly seeing the cartography as a game allows us to observe it from outside its so self-determined, self-defined infrastructure of technique and virtuosity. In effect, to examine mapicity from a high ground not otherwise accessible. Although this strategy by itself guarantees nothing, it may afford us understandings allowing Rewards ranging from implementation of true cartographic radicality to simply making better maps. As Leary wrote in 62, if the game contract is made explicit, behavior will change drastically in the direction that goals and, and roles demand. People who will also automatically shift rituals, adjust new rules, and employ appropriate language once the commitment is made. In the end, one can only game a system one understands as a game, and the game of playing is an integral part of mastering the game. And so, what do you think of that? Thank you very much.